Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at sedimentary environments and sedimentary rocks. So the final thing we're going to think about is why are sedimentary rocks so important to our society? And this is going to correspond to section 7.14 of your textbook. So the first thing to know about sedimentary rocks is they are a source of natural resources that human societies require. So the first thing and arguably the most important resource that sedimentary rocks contain is water in the form of groundwater. So if we look at this diagram here, you can see we have a couple of layers of rock. So we have this gray layer here and this rusty red colored layer here, which are porous. So they have pore spaces and those pore spaces are joined together. So they have porosity as well. And so that means that water, which falls on the surface in the form of rain, can then filter down into these porous layers of rock and the porous layer of rock will fill with water and we call this groundwater. Now this groundwater will become limited to certain porous layers and these porous layers are referred to as aquifers. And so as more water gets deposited here and moves down into the aquifer it will push the older water further along. So as human beings, if we live, for instance, over here and we're away from any source of water, what we can do is we can put a borehole down into the aquifer and we can pump the fresh water out. And we can use it for things like drinking or irrigating crops, for instance. Another resource which is commonly found in sedimentary rocks is petroleum, oil and gas. So the thing about petroleum is that in order to form it, you need a source rock. And that source rock has to have a large amount of organic material in it because it's the essentially it's the baking, the cooking of this organic rich layer of rock, which produces the hydrocarbons or, or the natural gas, which we will then pump out of the ground and use. So let's just say, for instance, this gray layer here represents our source rock. And so this is where the oil or gas is forming. Now, the oil or gas is going to be less dense than the surrounding material, so it's naturally going to want to rise. And so when it forms from our source rock, it's going to start to rise up and it's going to find a layer of rock, which once again is permeable. So it has porosity and it has permeability. And so the oil is going to move into the pore spaces in this rock. And this layer of rock is going to be referred to as the reservoir rock. Now over the top of the reservoir rock, we also have to have another layer of rock which is impermeable to the oil and gas, so they can't escape. And this is sometimes referred to as the cap. And this will essentially stop the oil or gas leaving the reservoir rock. And then as geologists, all we have to do is come along later and using some relatively basic geology, we can work out areas where we would expect gas or oil to naturally uh, channel themselves. And then of course we can study these areas using geophysics or we can just simply drill down into them to see if there's any oil or gas present. So sedimentary rocks are also the only host for coal. So we know that coal is um, produced by the lithification of very, very large amounts of organic material, which did not decompose. Now, coal on the whole is not a particularly great natural resource. The vast majority of coal that's um, burnt is something referred to as lignite also, or, and another type of coal called bitumous coal. And these types of coal have very, very high levels of impurities in them. So when you burn them, you create a whole load of very interesting and very nasty gases as a byproduct. Now, some kinds of coal are actually quite clean. So there's a, a type of coal called anthracite, which is an extremely pure version of coal. And if you burn that, most of what you get will be a mixture of carbon dioxide and water. So it's slightly better. But as resources go, coal is actually becoming uh, less and less sought after because it's you know, beginning to be seen for what it is, which is an extremely polluting source of energy. In reality, it's better to use uh, certain uh, other forms of energy, such as oil, natural gas, solar, wind, etc., to generate your power instead. So we need limestone in order to make cement. So cement, which of course is required for building, is made from essentially the extraction and processing of limestone. 
And so if we didn't have access to limestone, we would not have cement and human society would be in a lot of trouble pretty quickly in that respect. So the presence of limestone is very, very important when it comes to cement production. Sedimentary rocks are also the primary host for a whole range of interesting evaporite minerals, of which the most common is halite, which is known to us as salt. And so when it comes to finding salt and extracting salt, you will typically look for rock salt because it's the easiest material to extract the salt from. So you'll just put a shaft down and then you'll find your layer of salt and then you'll spread out laterally. Now these evaporite deposits are also useful for other things. So for instance, they may have a mineral called sylvite in them, which is potassium chloride. And sylvite is the primary mineral which is used to produce potassium for fertilizers. Then there's, also, then there's uh, gypsum. So gypsum, which was a mineral that we mentioned earlier, is also an evaporite mineral, but gypsum is used to make, uh, is used to make plasterboard. And so, um, as you can see, once again, it has an economic use. So the presence of these evaporite minerals is in some cases quite useful, not only to salt production, but also for the production of fertilizer and the production of building materials. The final resource that we're going to be looking at is uranium. So if we look at this diagram here, we have what's referred to as a roll front uranium deposit. So this tan colored layer of sedimentary rock here is porous, so it's an aquifer. And along this aquifer, we're going to have groundwater moving. And within this groundwater, we're going to have small amounts of uranium dissolved in it. And the uranium that's dissolved in the groundwater is present as uranium six plus. So, as our water containing the uranium-6 plus moves along the aquifer, it's perfectly happy, it's doing its thing, and then it comes to this edge here, and this is what's referred to as a redox boundary. So there's a change in the conditions. We're going from an oxygen-rich environment into a more oxygen-poor environment. And so as our oxygen-rich water begins to enter this oxygen-poor environment, it reduces the uranium which is dissolved in the water and it changes it from uranium 6 plus which is soluble to uranium 4 plus which is insoluble so the uranium has to come out of solution and it has to form minerals and it will typically form a range of uranium minerals of which the most common is the mineral uraninite and then later on geologists can come along and we can look for these roll fronts and you can actually see them uh, when you look at certain sandstone layers in areas like Saskatchewan in Canada you can see these quite commonly and you can simply either uh, extract the rock and process it or you can uh, do other things such as pump acid down and dissolve the uraninite here and pump it back out as a liquid. So uranium can be found in a whole range of different rocks, but very commonly these sediment-hosted uranium deposits are, possibly, you know, are arguably the most easy resources to access when it comes to uranium. So the final thing we need to think about is how does the study of sedimentary rocks actually help us to understand Earth history? Well, as we've discussed, we have the principle of uniformitarianism. So the principle of uniformitarianism at its most simple level simply states, if it's happening now, it's happened in the same way in the past. And so this is why uh, sedimentary geologists can go to modern sedimentary environments. They can look at the sediments that are found in those environments and they can come up with a set of criteria for each environment. So what kind of sediment would we expect to see? What kind of sedimentary structures would we expect to see? What kind of fossils might we expect to see? And so we can then apply these criteria to the rock record. We can walk up to our, our layer of rock and we think, can think to ourselves, right, which criteria does this layer of rock actually meet? And once we know that, we can then say, right, which environment essentially has these criteria? And by looking at that, we can work out, well, what was the past environment when that layer of rock formed? And so for each layer of rock in our sequence, the geologist is going to try and work out, right, how did layer A form? How did layer B form? How did layer C form? And we can do this simply by using uniformitarianism, by comparing what we find in modern sedimentary environments to what we see in the rock record. Now, once we have looked at the past environment, it's going to give us indications about the past climate. So, for instance, during periods in Earth history, we begin to see that large areas 
of the exposed continents began to become quite dry and desert-like. Well, this is obviously suggesting that the Earth as a whole is becoming a drier environment. We also have periods of time where we can see a reduction in the amount of glacial ice and we can see rising sea levels. Well, this is once again telling us that global climates are getting warmer, it's causing ice caps to melt and the water that's being released from those melting ice caps is entering the seas and it's causing the sea level to rise. In contrast, occasionally in the rock record, we will see an increase in the amount of glacial deposits and we will see a drop in sea level at the same time. And this is telling us that the global climate must therefore be cooling down because the water which was in the oceans is being locked up in the form of ice in glaciers. And so this means there's less water returning to the oceans. And so the general water level in the oceans, which we see as the sea level, is going to decrease. Obviously, the more glacial ice we have, the more glaciers we have and therefore the more glacial sediments will be produced. And so by looking at the sedimentary rock record for periods of Earth history, we can make uh, some pretty general but still accurate uh, hypotheses about what the climate was like during that period in Earth history. So obviously sedimentary rocks tell us quite a lot about past events. So for instance, things like tsunamis are going to be uh, kept in the fossil record. It's also going to show us other things such as extinction events. So when we look at fossils, we are obviously going to focus in on sedimentary rocks. And of course, an extinction event is a period in Earth history where we see an accelerated loss of species. So we suddenly see fossils which were common in the rock record just disappear very, very quickly. And we'll see lots of those fossils all disappearing at the same time. And so what we can do is we can look at our rock record and we can look at things like mass extinctions and we can compare it to other factors such as the climate and we can say, right, when this extinction was occurring, what was the global climate? And obviously we know the global climate by analysing the sedimentary rocks. And so you can see how this all begins to tie together. The next thing is that if we have a sequence of rocks, obviously that is going to allow us to come up with a sequence of events with the earliest or oldest event occurring in the layer of rock at the bottom and the most recent or youngest event occurring in the, to form the layer of rock at the top. And so once again, as a geologist, you're going to start at the layer of rock at the bottom and you are going to slowly work your way up the sequence, working out how each layer of rock formed. So what was the environment of deposition for layer A? What was the environment of deposition for layer B? What was the environment of deposition for layer C? And then once we've worked that out, we're then going to think about, right, what does this tell me about the climate, about the environment in this area at that time? So, for instance, you know, if we're seeing desert sediments, well, that's obviously going to suggest the climate in the area was relatively hot and relatively dry. If, on the other hand, we are going to, we see coal sediment, well, that's going to suggest that we're probably in a coastal environment, and that coastal environment was probably quite hot and quite humid. So, by analysing the rocks thoroughly, you can get a really good idea of what's happened when it comes to the environment uh, of a specific area on the Earth's surface throughout periods of geologic time. And of course, the final thing that sedimentary rocks contain is, of course, fossils. And this gives us a window into ancient life. Because when it comes down to it, the, you know, the animals that we know, for instance, the dinosaurs that lived in Earth history, the only reason we know they existed is because we have their fossils as part of the rock record. If the fossils weren't present, we would have no idea that Tyrannosaurus rex once stalked the earth. But because we do have fossils, we know that it existed. And so we can use those rocks to essentially, once again, date the fossils and work out where they fall in the earth history. Okay, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.